Back in New York City, advancing with watercolor, we're painting on location in Central Park, uh, where there's just a, an abundance of motifs. Past two days, we've been working uh, in and around the park. We did a cafe scene. We did a scene in Columbus Circle. Today, we moved over to Bethesda Terrace. And Bethesda Terrace is a really wonderful um, area with a pond, a huge fountain, uh, a lot of nice architectural elements, um, and surrounded by beautiful greenery, as you can see. Uh, today I'm talking a little bit more about starting with a tonal value study. This is a study that I did in preparation for my painting to organize the lights and darks into basically three values. The white of the paper, a mid-tone which covers most of the paper, and a dark element. Then I developed this uh, color study about the same size but watching my subject and paying attention on how I organize my values, even though I vary the colors, I try to maintain the uh, lights and dark aspect. So I'm really focused on that light pattern across the terrace. So I'm doing an underpainting to get things going and uh, preparing some of the lighter hues. The lighter hues would include a piece of sky, some of the light greens that are catching sunlight in the distance. It would include um, certainly the light pink color that we see uh, kind of sparkling on the terrace uh, in the morning light. In the photo, if you had a glance at the photo, you noticed that the light was um, uh, not as, the shadows were not as dark as I'm going to portray them. I took a little liberty with that because I saw them uh, with a bit of sunlight and I imagined them to be a little stronger and a little more lively. So the shadows are going to be a big focus, maybe the main focus in this painting. Um, I've already titled it Shadows Across Bethesda Terrace and I have some ideas on how I'd like to um, put down an energizing wash for the shadows and um, kind of play with the brush, uh, exploit some good brushwork, make brushwork uh, come to the forefront in the shadows. So here you see the underpainting. I've added a bit of uh, cad red to, to the light wash, to the lighter hues, and trying to get a bit of a graded wash. In other words, a transition from a lighter aspect to a darker aspect across the uh, the terrace. The perspective that uh, we're at in this location is a little unusual because we're looking down from an out from a, a height, a height of maybe two stories. And uh, so the the way that we place um, the fountain, for example, the way that we organize the architectural elements of a staircase and some fencing moving across the scene, and, and more, most importantly, the way that we organize the figures moving through the scene uh, will portray that perspective, will show that perspective with clarity. So my horizon uh, is very high in the painting. Everything is kind of below eye level. My eye level is actually with the top of the fountain and the trees. And uh, so everything below it is going to be... Uh, descending in the picture plane even though it's getting bigger. A little different than organizing perspective on a flat plane or on a, on a plane where we're looking uphill. <clears throat> I've uh, returned now with some dry washes to kind of portray the, the green element in the back, the, the trees that are part of the background. Uh, in particular on this day, the when the sun hits the trees, you get this very unique green, a very yellowed green, uh, that's indicative of spring. Springtime presents us with a very unique uh, aspect to the foliage, and it's short-lived. It's only around for a couple of weeks, and then the green starts to mature, and you get more browns and reds and a deeper, more ruddy green. But in the springtime, there's this... Uh, moment when you see really beautiful pale uh, yellowed greens. 
Well, now look at I'm developing that my main um, concept in this painting, which which is shadows cast from trees that we really don't see. The trees are off to the right and and lower down, but they <clears throat> they are casting long, long shadows because of the time of day, because of the angle of light that's creating these shadows. And as the I'm placing the shadows, I'm very conscious of how wet the wash is. I'm trying to make a unified wash from top to bottom and uh, create a pattern of, of intermittent shadows kind of playing on the Bethesda Terrace. I've added some cobalt blue while it's wet, and it might be hard to perceive at this stage, but that blue will come out more and more as the painting dries. Now I've switched over to a smaller brush to extend uh, the big passages that I've created. Um, this is typical. I'll, I'll, if I know I'm going to have a, a large wash, a big area, I go with as large a brush as I can manage and I try to do it with as few brush strokes as possible. Often the brush won't even leave the paper. This is a strength of watercolor that we can make such a big passage um, with one brush and sometimes with just one brush full of paint. This builds an integrity into the shadow and as the shadow dries it'll become more transparent when we place uh, figures into the shadow and uh, the idea of the pavement, the shadow itself will become more transparent as well. So I'm counting on those two things to make this large imposing shape recede a little more and feel integrated uh, into the scene. I'm extending uh, the same value into the fountain and trying to portray it with the same idea. In other words, a series of uh, connected brush strokes. My mindset in this painting and most of the paintings that I do is to almost think as a calligrapher would think where we have uh, one shot to kind of grab our subject with as few strokes as possible. So the concentration level is very high and we try to foresee our, our subject. In other words, we try to imagine it in terms of a few brush strokes and in the big when we were starting off uh, in this direction sometimes it's not clear uh, how to create the subject with a few strokes but as you do more painting as you use watercolor more and more the brush becomes more natural in your hand and you start to think in this manner where you're thinking oh, I can I know I can use the side of the brush to get this mark I can use the tip of the brush to get this mark I can use a sweeping gesture to get this mark etc etc and these marks they they translate our subject but they also translate uh, our emotion our intensity our drive uh, which I find to be an exciting part of painting, uh, not only in creating it, but in viewing it. Uh, some of my uh, the works that inspired me when I was younger had a strong gestural appeal to them, Franz Klein, um, including others who used brushwork as a major way to express themselves. Certainly the, um, the Japanese calligraphers, Chinese calligraphers, um, anyone, I guess, any um, culture that sprang out of using brushwork in their, in their culture to express letters, to express images, has this quality to it. Even in the, you know, their old artwork, the ancient artwork, uh, has this quality. It's not so much a modern concept. It's been around for a long time. But I feel it's a vital uh, part of my work, a, a part of my work that carries sort of my inner self, as it were. And uh, the result is a very tangible when you look at paintings that are kind of harnessing the power of the brush to express uh, uh, energy as well as the object. Then uh, this, this artwork has a, a, a unique life. I feel it has a special life. And that's what I try to bring to my pieces, is some 
joy with the brush, some exuberance with brushwork, uh, sort of, um, I don't know, life with the brush, I guess. Now I've, I've returned to the shadow. The shadow's dried. You can see it's, a, it's, um, it's still drying, but we're getting some glow in the shadow. We're seeing uh, the pa finished painting now, and the shadow is dried, and I've gone into it and placed the architectural elements. I'm adjusting it now to uh, quiet this corner, making some final adjustments to the, to the corner, to the figures. I'll be adding some highlights and some... Uh, more intense colors that will basically represent clothing highlights to bring them out from the shadows a little more uh, pavers the whole terrace is made up of brick if you can believe it yeah, this lovely uh, uh, warm brick that, that glows in the morning light when you have a, a warm light on top of it such as we were uh, seeing earlier then this brick starts to glow and the, the red comes through the shadows and sort of pervades uh, the figures walking through the shadows too. So all of this color kind of um, comes out as the shadows are drying and uh, we have a chance to return to some dry figures and add a few accents. We are working on location today and um, the crowd was very supportive. Uh, we had a lot of people come by and tell us, bravo, uh, we, we like what you're doing. We saw other painters working, and we had a very good morning. The weather cooperated and, uh, and gave us these, these beautiful examples of light and dark. Yes, you can see I'm adding some colors to liven up the darks. Uh, it's common for me to place a figure with a little bit of a darker accent uh, with the idea that I'll be returning to it as it's drying and apply some uh, bolder color uh, which sits on top of the dark color but it also assumes a little more of a, a quiet aspect and in this way I can liven up uh, some dark figures moving through the shadows. <laughs> the background has been left intentionally sort of nondescript. A few highlights of the original underpainting coming through the blue sky, the reflections in the distant water of that blue sky, and this uh, blue corner of the fountain has a particular appeal. We've left it also to represent the blue sky and that blue is echoing in the shadows and it's going to be picked up by a, a few of the figures as well. So a lot of the underpainting is showing through. As I said, for me, the, uh, the part that I wanted to really uh, play on was the angles of these shadows, the in intensity, the color of these shadows were really important for me. Now, I've used a, a smaller brush. This brush uh, is called a rigger, and I have no idea where I got mine. It's a, it's a very skinny, long-haired brush, uh, actually named for the purpose it was designed for, which is to create the rigging uh, that we see on, in nautical paintings on ships and masts. Uh, a lot of rigging where they need a skinny brush to portray all of these wires and uh, cables and skinny lines. So this is a useful brush for creating the, the marks that you see now on the terrace um, because it gives us a little bit of feeling, amplifies our feeling of perspective. It also makes the shadow feel more transparent. And as soon as we place the shadow, it had sort of a a heavy quality to it, but after we place the pavers and the figures, the shadow feels more transparent. So the, the original idea, my original title of Shadows Across Bethesda Terrace is kind of embodied in this painting. I feel happy about the brushwork that I used in realizing the terrace. So that's uh, our morning session. Let's go do a, a painting of um, 
the handsome cab that we see passing behind us. Uh, if you'd like to learn about the materials I lose, use, uh, there's a description underneath this video. And in that description, I, I have a link to a, a PDF file that describes all the materials that I use. Um, in the description is also a link to my Instagram page where you can see recent examples of my work and, and also a little description of, of Bethesda Terrace. So have a look at the description before you, before you leave. Thanks very much, and see you uh, next to a handsome cab.